You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. Kicking off the Oberman Conversations um, this year, um, I'm happy to have Melissa Tolley, um, who is a professor in journalism and mass communication. And Melissa was at the Oberman Center this past um, summer as part of our interdisciplinary research grant program. And that encourages pairs or trios of faculty who one is from Iowa, the other one can be from a, another institution, and um, to work together on on an ongoing project that they're kind of trying to bring to some kind of fruition. And so Melissa was working with um, Emily, is it Vraga? Um, from George Mason, and I think is going to be sharing some of that exact project this afternoon. Um, so Melissa um, has also done a lot of very interesting work in um, uh, in Africa especially, um, and looking at media in developing countries. And so I don't know if that's going to play in at all today, but, but really. there's, some, there's some interesting work there. So um, <laughs> you can throw it. So in learning more about Melissa's work this summer and um, around media literacy, I thought of um, connecting her with, with Matt because one thing that I've been really impressed with um, Matt at the helm of Little Village is how he's clearly really interested in getting this publication out into the broader community and having it be very much a two-way street. And I've actually had conversations with him about how do you get media production in the hands of more people and so they can better appreciate the process. Um, so Matt is currently the publisher of Little Village as well as the art director, which is like an awesome pairing, and um, was formerly the managing editor, and I'm guessing with a publication like Little Village, there's a lot of wearing many hats. Um, he, um, another noteworthy point in his bio is that he's worked a lot with Oasis Falafel as they're um, kind of doing their marketing and their logo, and then also helping Oasis move very, we're all very thankful for this move onto the campus, um, giving us better food options. And um, he is currently an MFA candidate in social practice and design here at Iowa. So um, you could apply for this program. We'd love to have you. So, all right. So I look forward to hearing them in conversation and please help me welcome them. Hi all, thanks uh, so much for, for coming out today. So I am going to just try to briefly talk about this concept of news media literacy specifically, um, and a little bit about the work that I've done and some of the upcoming work um, that Jennifer mentioned, some of the work that we started here at the Oberman Center uh, this summer. So really the, the work that we've been doing is about message and media consumption. Right. So how people um, consume and think about content and we're really specifically interested in news and I'll, I'll get at that in a moment. But I just wanted to put up this qu quote from Renee Hobbs, who's one of the leaders in media literacy education. And it really it gets at the heart of why we care. Right. There's so much information out there. How do we discriminate between the high quality information in which she calls marketing hype and silly or harmful junk? That's really important, particularly in a world where lots of things masquerade as news. So this is an issue that that we are really interested in. And one thing I love about this quote is she talks about lifelong learning. So that is something that Emily and I have focused on. We've really tried to think about how media literacy can work and operate outside of a classroom. as not just something you learn about in K through 12 or college, but how you can do it and engage with it in your life. So specifically about news media literacy, so we're calling what we do um, news media literacy messages, and I'll get at that in a moment. But how can these messages make people more critical, capable news consumers? Can they? Can, does it, can we do anything to help us think a little bit more? So news media literacy involves three um, related concepts. This is what I was getting at why we're focusing on news. News itself is a big thing. So we're really looking at three um, aspects to news. One being the constraints of the news process, so how news is made, um, the choices, the editorial choices, something that Matt can, can speak to. 
Then something that we think is really important is the role of media and democracy. So the idea that news is actually essential to a functioning democracy, right? That we, we need to hear diverse viewpoints. We need the news to help us become informed before we make important civic and political decisions. And then our job as consumers of this, of this content, our job as citizens to actually think and engage with news content, consume diverse content, and then make decisions off of that content. So we see this as an interrelated set of, of concepts. So one thing we want to do is how do we take those messages, things that students learn about in, in classrooms, there are plenty of classes on media literacy, media effects, etc., and bring them into our everyday life. So one thing that we've started to do, Emily and I, is we've developed these short um, public service announcements, essentially. They're really short. They range 30 to 40 seconds. And we are testing through experiments uh, which I can talk a little bit more about, how these messages, if at all, can make people think about news media literacy and how it relates to their lives, and also how can it um, affect their processing and thinking about content that they get immediately. So what that means is that we have, what we've done is we've created these messages and what we did at the Oberman Center this summer was created new ones that we actually launched yesterday, the newest experiment, so I'm excited to find out what happens. Um, we created these little videos, these PSAs, and we set them up to look like they were a forced ad before a YouTube video, so that you, you know, when you, everyone's probably been to YouTube, they, they often make you watch an ad. Well, why can't be an ad with, why couldn't it be an ad with a social message, right? So we um, put this um, experimental design where you got the ad and then you were then received news content. So some of the things that we found in all of this, these findings are from various experiments, and I'm happy in the Q&A to talk more about what that looks like. Um, we found a lot of interesting things. First of all, people respond differently to the messages depending upon their political ideology. We asked people, how, you know, are you Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative? And we found some interesting differences. So in our early study we did in 2009, we actually found that liberals, when they received the message, um, were more, more, let's say nice to, to content they received that uh, was from Fox. So they actually rated it a little bit more highly. And we actually manipulated the content. It wasn't actually from Fox. We just put Fox as the source, as a, you know, a cue. But then in a later study, we actually found that conservatives responded better. We changed the message a little bit. So we still don't really know what's going on, but we know political ideology is important and it, it, it influences how people see these messages and the content. Then we've also found that different media contexts, so where you put these messages matter. So we embedded them with uh, an array of kinds of content, um, all political news, but with different styles. So an aggressive host who's like yelling at people and then a nice host. And it, it actually makes people respond differently to the message. Um, and then another finding that we're um, really interested in actually looking at now is that our personal predispositions, so things like um, being a liberal or conservative, but also people who just enjoy critical thinking more. There's a concept called need for cognition. People in higher need for cognition tend to be more acceptable of these messages. Um, also, we've done some work on students in different classes, and it turns out that if you're in a class that's about media and media effects, these messages work better. You're already primed to be thinking about. So these are some of the things that we've already done. And what we're working on now, um, like I said, we just launched a new experiment and it's we have four PSAs that we developed over the summer and we've, we're doing something different. Instead of pairing it with something that you would consider a strict news program, we're pairing it with an old daily show clip. You can see it's still Jon Stewart. So uh, a Jon Stewart clip in which he is being a media critic. He is criticizing cable news. And he's not picking Fox or CNN or MSNBC. He's criticizing them all and saying they do a terrible job at covering breaking news and providing analysis. And they, they set us up to follow false tracks, basically. So we're thinking, hmm, what if we take a message that tells you to be media literate, combine it with some media criticism, what's that going to do? TBD. It's out there right now. We'll find out. So we're fielding that right now. And we're also doing some interviews with folks that includes a media literacy task, we're calling it. And this task involves um, asking people to read. You can see a little bit of the two articles, asking people to read and analyze these two articles um, after we've asked them tons of questions and made them talk about their news consumption forever. Um, and one of them's from Fox, and it's about the drought in California, and the other one is from New York Times, and it's about the drought in California. One takes a more human interest approach where it's about the people and what they're dealing with, and one is, as you can see, 
global warming focused. And so we're really trying to get people to read and analyze these in front of us and in conversation with us so we can see how does someone think about a story? What sticks out to them? What, how do they compare and contrast these kinds of things? So we actually have already conducted, I think we're at 12 interviews and I'm conducting them here and Emily's conducting them in Virginia and she has a research assistant conducting them in DC. So we're trying to get a, a broad, um, broad swap there. So some things we're interested in, um, what works, what gets people to think and to actually consume media critically. We value that, we see that as a normative good. So we want people to do that under what conditions um, how, how does combining the PSAs with different types of content, like The Daily Show, how does it include these outcomes? Political participation being one of them that we're really starting to look at now. So we can say, oh, yeah, wow, people can analyze and think critically. So what if they don't do something with that information? That's that sort of next step. And then the interviews are helping us learn how people self-define and understand news media literacy, if at all. I can tell you when I say that term to any, anybody that I've interviewed so far, nobody has heard that term before. But when they start thinking through what it is, then they say, oh, sure, I get that, critical thinking, okay. And then looking at news content. So like I said, we think that this actually has implications for democracy and participation. Um, and, and there is a lack of research into how news media literacy actually affects democratic outcomes beyond just your thinking process. So how do you then make a decision? about what you're going to do. Uh, we're also looking at media efficacy and participation, so something that um, we talked to Matt a little bit about, political efficacy, and then um, the idea of media creation. This is the thing that we have not been able to study, Me, my colleague and I. There are people who have studied this, and I can talk to you about the, how people learn by creating media, but I really want to talk to Matt about that because he gets people to do that, right? So this is another quote from Hobbes that I wanted to, to end with, um, where she gets at the need to be a creator as much as a consumer. And she talks about participating in contemporary culture, being able to be, create and share messages to, to experience digital citizenship. So I really like um, her focus on acquiring skills that include the ability to compose messages Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So uh, this is an area that we, when 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 actually you say the definition of media literacy, the last part of it is create, and we haven't gotten there yet in our work. Other people have, and I think um, there's a lot to be done there. Though we don't necessarily know how that then contributes to civic participation. So um, with mm -hmm. that, I just wanted to make another note for Emily. She is my co-author and colleague on all of this work, and obviously to the Oprah <coughs> Center for supporting us. Now we get to talk about silly junk masquerading as media <laughs> <get> some more. No. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm Matt from Little Village, and I think that we might actually be a couple slides up. Yeah, there, there we, we go. go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, essentially what this comes down to for us and uh, what particularly attracts me to Melissa's research is that uh, we feel as a publication that our primary role is to uh, produce some sort of representation of the Iowa City community, and no group of eight people is qualified to do that on their own. So um, we haven't quite mustered the vanity to think that we've achieved it without really aggressively uh, trying to make a central part of our activities, reaching out and getting uh, submissions from the public. Um, so yeah, we're Little Village. This is our predecessor publication, Icon. Uh, Maeve uh, has a, a, an archive of these at the library. She's mm -hmm. nodding her head. Hello, Maeve Clark. Thank you for coming. Um, so uh, Icon was a weekly in the 90s in Iowa City that was very successful, and uh, they, they were so successful that they got bought out by a regional publishing house out of Indiana, and then a couple of months later, they got shut down. Um, <laughs> they were very excited for all of the national advertising at works that they were going to have access to, and then they disappeared completely, and they didn't even have a name. So uh, Dave Zolo, who was in the band High and Lonesome, his wife was uh, our art director, uh, Beth Oxler. Uh, Zolo, and uh, she was part of the team that somehow, very heroically, in my opinion, managed to reopen as a new publication, the new name. They started out a twice monthly. Uh, this, I think, was their first kind of announcement. They were, this was a, 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 a flyer that I found. They were kind of announcing themselves, coming July 1st to a street corner near you. Uh, that would have been in 2001. Uh, they this the name actually came from Dave Zolo. It's a Sonny Boy Williamson song that's 
kind of funny to look up uh, on YouTube. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a small town. You can name it Chomami if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dave was a little bored with the conversation in the other room, and he said, why don't you call it Little Village? Um, so they did. And uh, here we are, 14 years later, uh, all kinds of silly junk. Uh, no. Uh, so this is our current issue. Um, we're uh, obviously roasting uh, uh, Rastetter and Branstead here and their, uh, their, um, their shared governance uh, uh, joyride. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of our stuff is kind of opinionated, and that's a little bit of the idea. And I think that it's really rooted in that desire to kind of uh, spark a conversation. We've gotten letters to the editor on this, and we love to publish those. And that's kind of when we know we're kind of doing it right is when we get a lot of engagement um, from the public. Uh, so we're currently, uh, this is our kind of readership trend. You know that um, this has not been a good decade for print publications broadly, but in Iowa City, we've been fortunate to see growth. Uh, in 2010, our per issue readership was 14,000, and five, six years later, we're now at 55,000 readers per issue. Uh, we were monthly in 2010. That twice monthly thing lasted about one month uh, in 2001, <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 then we just went back up in 2012 to twice monthly. And I think we're pretty happy there, though I kind of like to go weekly. Uh, this is just a run through of kind of what we do. This is our website. We've host, we have interviews with artists coming through town, interviews with local artists, local issues. Uh, we have an app where all of our uh, Iowa City events are listed. This is a more or less comprehensive listing of music events, art exhibitions, drink specials. I won't say how popular the drink specials channel is, <laughs> uh, but I think you can guess you've all seen the statistics. Um, so if you don't have it and you like drink specials, <laughs> you can find a little Village Best of IC in the App Store or you can text the word Iowa to 77948. I promise that's my last straight up advertisement. Uh, the role of media, this is something that we've kind of come into in reverse, or at least me personally. Uh, I, I am an anthropologist as an undergrad and uh, I was an anthropology and studio arts double major and I basically came into it as a fan. I enjoyed culture. I had a lot of social justice work going on in my undergrad career and our alternative media really seemed to me like the intersection of all those things, culture writing, visual arts, and social justice. Uh, but as we understand what we're supposed to be doing, uh, it's not that different from a conventional media organization. We create a cultural geographic identity for the area and send that out into the world, give people something to rally behind and feel like they have a sense of place in, uh, the, with the object they hold in their hands. Uh, we do provide some information like that calendar app and some other political content, other hard news, and just kind of cultural curation that our, our editors do to help locals and visitors navigate life and have a good time in the area. Uh, do facilitate political debate. We uh, will be very interested to chat with Melissa about this because we didn't really come at this as... Um, uh, traditional journalists that want to kind of in to not to be too to paint with too broad a brush but um, would maybe feel in pressure to represent a range of viewpoints we're really kind of focusing on what we think is going to improve the community um, but along the way I think like any media organization we try to contribute to the economic development of the area by creating a platform where companies can share their advertising messages for prices that I can get you anytime uh, just shoot me an email no um, so yeah we basically we, we, we do journalism uh, it's like something that we've had to learn over the years and we publish essays and art and we organize events and the difference is that we're alternative media that means that we are here to change our community and we're trying to change our community according to some specific values. And these are affordability and access, economic and labor justice, environmental sustainability, racial justice, gender equity, quality health care, quality education. And the last one is sort of our catch all for stuff that we just think is cool. Uh, critical culture, uh, whether that's a local musician who's put out an album that we think everyone in the world needs to hear or an artist that's coming through town that has 
created some innovation. Uh, the perfect example is uh, Silver Apples was here for Mission Creek, and the uh, the guy Simone uh, from Silver Apples was like in his seventies or eighties, and back in the sixties he invented the instruments that we now associate with electronic music. But nobody knows this guy's name, and uh, so that's exactly the kind of show that we really want to promote. Uh, someone who's had a profound impact on what we know of as contemporary art uh, and needs to be appreciated and is a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to go out and see. Um, so that's Little Village. And um, I think that this is either questions or conversation or mm -hmm. both. It's kind of casual, right? Yep, very. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, you're done with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess, uh, one of the things that, uh, that's been on my mind recently is, uh, I was just in, we were talking about Andre earlier, Andre Perry and Joe Tiefenthaler from Film Scene and myself were in New York last weekend talking with some cultural presenting organizations about creative placemaking and what that means. And one of the things that I really liked this place, Art Place, uh, which is a a National Endowment for the Arts and Knight Foundation funded 10-year study about creative placemaking to see what works and how it happens. And the three things they said people are looking for are an aesthetic experience, social opportunities, and a sense of openness. And the sense of openness is, I think, what is difficult to approach in alternative media because you want to be taking a stand, but you also don't want to be stomping out conversation. <laughs> Um, so I, I was really interested in Melissa's work to see the way people respond to uh, ad messages and, and, and other cues when they're in an environment mm -hmm. that resonates with their pre-existing ideology. And what does that mean for the future if we are constantly trying to keep people in an environment where they feel like they're amongst their own uh, as the options increase over time it seems like we read less variety mm -hmm. and is that something that you see what, what are the implications in your research for that yeah I think that's a critical issue right so one of the things that we take for take as a normative good in our at the starting point almost of our research is that you should expose yourself to diverse views and diverse sources but we don't as people right as people we generally read things that we agree with and we talk to people that we agree with, and then we go back to find more information to confirm the things that we already believe, and the cycle continues. So that, this is something that, that I think becomes an issue uh, for consumers and creators. So you all at Little Village have no problem saying that you have a viewpoint and that your views are this and that and the other thing. So you're telling people, you're signaling to people right away come to us if you agree with us, but you're also signaling perhaps to the people who want to troll you to come to mm -hmm. us if you want to troll us and be mean to us. So we're really concerned with this actual conversation, deliberation, right? Reading the other side or seeing the other side and not immediately attacking it because it's against your worldview or it's against the quote unquote evidence that, that you have. So we see and I see stuff like alternative media and, and Little Village as a fundamental part of a media diet of a news diet that you should be reading a range you should be consuming a range because you need evidence to then decide your point right so i think that it, it's perfectly appropriate to say that you have a viewpoint and then to present it and to say you know we're open and inclusive mm -hmm. to a degree right you, mm -hmm. you've said before you don't publish necessarily things that maybe some other outlet might, but I think it's our job as, as readers and consumers to know what we're getting into, accept that that's only one position. And then it's your job as creators and to bring participants in who maybe can challenge you and, and push back on perhaps some, like you said, you're going to publish perhaps letters to the editor that go against, you might, right? You At least it's an editorial decision sure. that you all will make. So I, I think that the idea of, of us as consumers and as people just staying in our own world is a real problem and one of the fundamental problems we're seeing in our political discussion and debate right now and so one thing that that we want to do and we believe is important is how to get people to to step back and think it's okay if i can talk to someone who doesn't agree with me or it's okay if i'm wrong <laughs> so one thing we're actually testing in our newest uh, experiment is we have a whole set of questions that ask people basically 
if you change your mind, is that okay? Mm -hmm. How firm do you need to be on your beliefs? And, and this is something that I think is fundamentally important in our current you know, current environment. So I, I think that, that the role of publications in places like Little Village is to foster discussion and dialogue, whether it be one that you feel comfortable with or not, but perhaps to open up your, your space mm -hmm. a little bit. And as you've noted in conversations with me, just to be transparent about what those values are and maybe place them in a place that, uh, <clears throat> you know, our list of values aren't, well, make Democrats win every time. That's not our list of values. It's pursue right. economic justice, pursue environmental sustainability. And these are values that are often, they, they come into conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. Like the most sustainable solution might not be the best for economic justice or for, you know, so they become conflicted, they, they become complicated and you can give an honest assessment of, of what the issues are at play. And you can sort of uh, be transparent that yes, we are trying to push forward an agenda, but our agenda is not partisan it's right. it's that we want to see more justice in our community and i think that's a something that people as you know readers and consumers we need to understand that and you know it's not fair to just group something saying oh this thing is like this or this thing is like that without actually giving it a chance or weigh, weighing the, the 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 evidence presented doing those kinds of things so if you yeah i think it's good that you guys when you were mentioning your mission we were talking yesterday and you were mentioning your mission statement how it's become much more explicit about your values i think that kind of transparency is so important and we can we that's lacking in most mainstream media there's very little transparency so to have that and that's that's the role of alternative mm -hmm. media in general they're usually pretty transparent about what they're all about and i think that's refreshing and it shows that there's you know space mm -hmm. for for dialogue Yes, and in, in contrast, we our previous statement was a little more general. It was basically that we champion the small and local, yet uh, we believe in considering more than one side of a story. And above all, we want to hear from the people of Iowa City and make Little Village their magazine. That's kind of how it read. And, uh, you know, that's all great. But we when we added those uh, specific values, we definitely anecdotally, compared to your scientific approach, just I can say that we've already been able to see an uptick in letters to the editor, an increase in kind of comments and the submissions, the tips that we get are more on point. They say, I think that this is very pertinent. This art exhibition is very pertinent, pertinent to your core value of racial justice in our community. And that's awesome. It helps our editors mm -hmm. kind of figure out what we should approach and what we shouldn't when people, when they're attempting to engage us and participate and, and submit stories are able to speak in those terms that we kind of provide for them. It just, uh, I guess it, it, it helps us make those decisions editorially. Uh, it helps people understand how to pitch us. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the engagement we've only seen about a month and a half of, since we've updated our, our website, but I can tell it's already um, increased quite a bit. Want to open it up? Sure. Well, actually, I had a question. <laughs> it's quite, quite relevant just to that, just to get more on that. Do you, um, do mainstream media generally have an obvious like set of core values or mission statement that that is driving it that a reader can easily access? Because I'm like flipping through my, you know, what I use for news, and I can't say that I could pinpoint anything. Yeah, I think all news outlets have something. Usually they have a mission statement or an ethics or core values types of things, but they're usually more broad and they're related to like journalism ethics. And there are, there's like the Society of Professional Journalists who says like these are the core ethics and things like that. So very rarely, I, you know, I'd, I've never done an assessment of, of organization mission statements, but I think if you're presenting yourself as like a straight news source, you're, you're, usually trying to say you you know you're doing the balanced and the all of that kind of thing um so i would i would say that most news organizations definitely have that values and ethics and things that drive them how much how transparent and open very it, it's going to probably be on a huge spectrum right in terms of how much that is at the core of what they want their audience to know and how much it's sort of the the values that drive the the organization and you know frankly no one's going to say well we're driven by ad revenue and economic indicator no one's going to say that even though that's something that drives lots of production yeah. and lots of things so I, I do think that there's different levels of transparency and there are definitely things that media outlets could do to be better but I think this falls back onto us as consumers to actually look into media ownership 
for example, who is making decisions, that information is available. You just need to think through it and find it. And that, that's kind of our, our responsibility is to do a little more digging, I think, behind if you care about an issue or you care about a publication to actually dig into it a little bit. So what, what I think people in general don't understand is the ad revenue driven media. And they're not, they're, they go to the media, whatever it is, the newspaper, and they're very frustrated because the news is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. If you live in Iowa City, you're, the reporters are fewer and fewer, and they don't understand that Gannett is driven by advertising, and advertising has disappeared. So I think that's part of also the media literacy that it's not, you can't just complain about it because there's a reason for it existing, and, and you have some ad revenue that's driving you. I mean, you can't exist without the selling of ads. You, you're not a free publication because you're wealthy, unless I don't know you very well, Matt. I mean, you still have to have, have ads to exist. And I think that that part, people just don't understand that media doesn't exist just because we need it. It also has to have some kind of financial support, and it's not all philanthropically done. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, one thing about that, which I've actually been pleasantly surprised, it's a very small number, the amount of interviews we've done, I was mentioning that, but almost everyone that I've talked to recognizes that there is a profit motive to news media, which is very good, because I, I do feel like we can fall into this trap thinking that, you know, people are just dupes or whatever it is. I think people are somewhat aware of the models and what, you know, maybe they don't know, understand the full range of business models, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're willing to actively think through the process or the implications of, of, of that. So one part we do, I 100% agree with you that a part of media literacy is understanding the the, the, the um, ownership and, and, and those kinds of things. So that's something we're looking into as well. We have questions in our current study about ownership. How many how many companies own all the, you know, the majority of media? We have those kinds of questions now too, because we actually want to know, do people see the relationship between ownership or advertising and content. So uh, we've seen people do recognize that. And another thing I saw really start coming out in these interviews, people know and they put themselves in this category. They're not saying necessarily that, oh, I am so thoughtful. They're saying, you know, sometimes I just want to be entertained. And news has started to, news and entertainment are so murky. And so people kind of recognize that, but they don't necessarily then say, well, that's a problem and I'm going to go about and, you know, Make sure I read five stories about every topic to compare and contrast evidence and, you know. So I think there's recognition but from some people, but not necessarily action. Yes, a steady diet of 10 boring articles a day. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Uh, it's also, there's also just kind of a little bit of, I don't know, I, not that, uh, not, not that our staff of eight are so happy and we're so successful but like the media industry in general needs to grow up a little bit and figure out that it needs to figure out a way to sustain itself it's what's what's so honorable about the ad industry that we have to like prop it up or you know that we have to we're, we have to stay married to it you know i mean i think that in as much as you can prove the value of what you're selling then hopefully people will buy it but if you can't then you need to find something else to sell and um, find another way to get support but the philanthropic support that had been available for probably the peak period of the alternative media um, rise in like the 80s and 90s is much less readily available mm -hmm. those uh, grants are really limited uh, and they're not the, the IRS isn't approving 501c3 uh, conversions for publications like ours the way they were mm -hmm. 10 years ago, which I wish I would have been on the ball for. <laughs> um, we, we serve a 14-year-old chihuahua, by the way. That's the master. <laughs> I to, if I don't show up on Friday with treats, Yes, then it's over. It's over. <laughs> well, that's a really interesting segue to my question. Um, no, it really is, because um, I wanted to talk about the idea of, of uh, market segmentation and... Um, you know, I think that there are certain media platforms that are going more to the membership model. And I, I think, especially on the left, when you look at something like Daily Cause or Democracy Now!, um, and I imagine there's things on the right. I mean, my crazy aunt in Florida gets a lot of memes from somewhere. Um, so, um, 
you know, I would, I, that's not necessarily great for opening up a community. Um, and so how do you, how do you think about that? How do you think about the segment of a, of a publication like Little Village? Because when you talk to business people, they're going to want to know, you know, who's picking this up. Um, and so how do you, like, how do you think about that? And how does that also play into uh, thinking about populations for, within your research? Yeah, um, I think a huge part of what I have to do as publisher is look at everything that I can glean from Google Analytics, from Facebook Analytics, and from census, uh, census data in our distribution range. And we also have to look at our pickups. Are they getting picked up or not? Uh, as long as they are getting picked up, we can kind of extrapolate some information about who the populations are in the areas that we distribute, and we can... Uh, use that information to reflect and engage the population based on what we know about those folks. Um, and sometimes in a little bit of a provocative way too, right? Um, that can sort of hopefully impact uh, their view of people in parts of town that they don't interact with naturally. Um, so as far as memberships are concerned, that's another great um, avenue for people to pursue and something that we've looked at. Um, I, I think that it's good for engagement. I love what Film Scene has done with making people know that they're part of having built this. That was a defining feature of their capital campaign was that we'd rather have a thousand people give us 50 bucks than 25 people, you know? Uh, they knew that for the theater to sustain itself, they needed to show that there were people in the seats and they weren't sure uh, that that would happen if they couldn't prove it up front, you know? Um, so that was kind of their initial proof was, yeah, we've really got something here because we've got a community that's willing to pay for it and it's not just a couple people with deep pockets. Um, so I think that's, a, I guess, a perfectly reasonable part of what you pursue as a publication. And that idea of creating a shared sense of ownership is amazing. It's, you know, it's good community building. And I think that's an example of the positive side and the perhaps the local side, right? That works when you're trying to form something and, and think of, and you're thinking about it as an inclusive opportunity. But on the other side of what you're talking about, when you close things off to people or you say to get this information you need to pay, you're really making someone say they commit. Right. So how, how many people are going to be willing to commit to pay ten dollars a month to access information that they don't agree with? Very few. So on that side, then you are closing off perhaps some of those opportunities for people to truly stumble upon or engage with divergent viewpoints. So from a, a sort of a macro, you know, level thing, and if we're thinking about large large organizations or large media outlets, yeah, that, that's when an economic tension an economic tension and a social democratic you know what's your role really do clash right because if you're if if you're thinking about oh well, where you know where this where the you know the new york times and our role is to inform you know educate all these things that we think about for large media but yet oh you can get 10 articles a month and then you have to pay us well is that really you know you're kind of speaking with your with your paywalls more than you are with your practice so i think that's a huge tension because as everyone knows and we've just like, People don't know how to make money right now. And so that's why we're seeing things like paid content, you know, advertisements masquerading as articles. This is a, this is, we're in a sort of turbulent time of what's what in terms of what's news, what gets to go where, how can we make money, how can we still serve our purpose? Is the news still a watchdog, right? How can we do all of this stuff? There's so many tensions, and I think different organizations are trying to grapple with them in different ways that serve both their their bottom line, but also who they see as their their target audience, right? Who is their segment that they care most about? Mm -hmm. So it can have really good implications of building community and doing this, but when you're inclusive, you're also fundamentally exclusive to some to some population. So I think it can kind of go both ways. And uh, regarding a paywall, we have discussed it and would never really pursue that because it's not on our list, but a really essential core value of ours is to increase access to culture across class lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why our tagline is always free. <laughs> um, it's essential to us that we're constantly pushing these physical objects into as many areas as we can, and we do not want to charge for access to that content. 
Um, just to kind of clarify our stance on that, when I talk about membership, I mean voluntary. You know, yeah. um, we have thought about a subscription model where if we get a thousand people, I, these numbers are sort of fresh in my mind because we've kind of thought about this, but um, if we can get a thousand people to give us five dollars a month, then we can start mailing an issue each two weeks to those thousand people, and we can we just have to get to that threshold and. We haven't gone on that campaign yet. I'm not sure if we will, but... This um, kind of model is becoming, I feel like, increasingly popular, right? Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of podcasts are doing this, and you are, like, smaller outlets. Where you, yeah, you can contribute. Everyone else can still get the other stuff, but you can mm-hmm. get... Or you maybe you give right, them a exactly. t-shirt. Yeah, or, yeah, right, so there are these right. models that Some, are sort of trying to figure out that middle ground mm-hmm. where you don't close people off, but you say, hey, you're kind of our... That would be Iowa Public Radio. Yeah. This yeah. Week. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, right. Public Radio is the... Obviously, yeah, probably, you know, they are the exact the example, but now other people are trying to figure out little ways to do it kind of differently almost. I don't know, it's like you get some exclusive content perhaps, or this you know, your, the, mug. the mug, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It, it's interesting because I don't know it, what how does it scale? Like, yeah, there's lots of sort of fundamental things, you know, people get it when it's public radio, and but when you say, Oh, I work for a for profit media company, I also want you to be a member, right? That's <laughs> a little bit where people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You just right. never thought of it as That's a, a really good point. You never thought of it as a membership because it just came to your house and you paid the paper boy or the girl, and now you just do it electronically. Mm-hmm. But it really is like, like a really the same and then kind. When yeah. It became electronically available. It all changed because mm-hmm. you could get it for free, but then you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Give us all your data. Mm-hmm. So I want to go back to this topic of changing your mind that you mentioned earlier. I find that really fascinating because I know in the political realm, we talk about flip floppers and how negative that is. So I wanted to ask if you've done any work with people who've changed their minds and what their response has been. And then also ask if Little Village has ever retracted an article or changed its mind um, and and what example you could possibly give of, of that. Yeah, so we are just um, starting to look at this now in the new in the new um, research that we put out. So one thing that we're um, looking at is yeah, we, the set of um, qualities, right? So how um, tied are are you the type of person who will stick to your guns no matter what? Being faced with you know mounting evidence again, there you know there there's a range of people, or will you? Be open. So we look at it as not like us flip flopping, but as being open to hearing other evidence and saying, "Oh, okay, I, I, you know, I was wrong," or I will at least consider that. So this is this is um, our first time looking at this, and we really want to see if we if people who are more likely to um, say they're open to diverse viewpoints than if they perhaps get material or get a message that is not aligned with them, if what they actually then do. After, because we all probably think of ourselves as people who are willing to be open and do all that kind of stuff. So um, we're just really starting to look at this now. But one of the things that we um, looked at in previous research is how willing, and this is a, a uh, something that's currently um, under review right now, but how willing people were to talk to people with differing opinions. And so we found some interesting things with if they got the media liter- literacy messages or not, if they said they would be willing to at least have um, discussion. With, with different people. Um, and so we're, we're starting to grapple with that because we do think that's sort of a fundamental issue because of exactly the point you brought up where all of a sudden it's bad to like listen and take other, you know, take evidence into account. We're just supposed to be stuck to our views forever, right? So we're, we're actually kind of thinking, huh, what, what would foster this discussion? What would make someone actually say, yeah, I'll, I'll sit down and have a conversation with someone who's different than me? And something we're also exploring in the interviews. And most people that we've talked to so far um, that I've talked to said they generally speak to people who are like them because they generally speak to their friends and family. That makes sense. And if they know someone is ha- is um, strongly opposed to their view, say they just know them as an acquaintance, they will purposely avoid the issue that they, and the one, you can probably pick, guess the ones that come up, religion and politics. If they know someone is not in line with them, they don't even want to go there. Because why, why ruin a, an acquaintanceship? So it is something that we're really starting to um, look into and to see if there is a relationship between what you consume, how you think, and how you, um, how you talk. Yeah, I think that in our, in our case, uh, I think we often are just finding ourselves wishing 
maybe we're finding new information that makes us feel like the story we told could have been more complete, you know? Um, so there haven't been many cases where we've had to outright retract a, an entire opinion. Uh, but we have, uh, on many occasions, sought to find another writer that can represent an additional consideration mm -hmm. that, you know, makes our overall coverage of that issue hopefully a little closer to complete. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, and, 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 and corrections certainly, you know, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, you have to fairly regularly, um, clarify something. We're working on copy for one, uh, in our upcoming issue when, and I should take this opportunity to promote this person because, uh, her work was amazing. We did an article a couple of issues back about Linda Eaton, who was, uh, Iowa city's first female firefighter and found herself in the middle of a big, uh, a big mess, uh, attempting to breastfeed her child at work. And, uh, and wound up having a great deal of influence in Iowa City as we were kind of producing th these policies or uh, editing our policies. And um, we heard about this story and we thought, wow, this woman is a hero. And we, we, wanted, we, 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 we tried to find information. We stumbled across this dissertation that uh, Sharon Tate wrote. Uh, I think it was called The Accidental Feminist. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was amazing we found all these sources we found her on Geraldo we found local news we found national news and we found these state historical society kind of sources and we went and pursued them and the the, the writer uh kind of compiled all this into an extremely condensed version of the story it's like you know a thousand words as opposed to this dissertation literal dissertation <laughs> um and uh and we all high fived each other and um, went to press. And then about a week later, I got this email from uh, Linda Eaton that uh, you know our article looked an awful lot like her dissertation. And uh, and I said, well, yeah, of course. I mean, it was completely instrumental. Our the writer and she said, well, the writer didn't say anything. I was like, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> went through. Like, we did. It was so it was so central to her as like her jumping off point for all of these and and. Uh, and that was just so embarrassing, and I was so sorry to her that we hadn't done that. So, um, and this, like, we immediately published an editor's note on the on the website article, directing people to read the whole dissertation if they were um, moved by the story. And uh, and we're gonna put something in print in the next edition as well. <laughs> um, so that's the first one that jumps to mind. <laughs> um, so, uh, Sharon Tate, you rock. <laughs> <laughs> So we were talking about um, news media diets. Uh, what I find in the diet right now is very spicy and angry people. Um, how do you guess trustworthiness from their tones? Because it, it's almost like, I mean, I switch it off because it appears extremely untrustworthy. So why waste time? So it, it's not just you want to be a critical thinker but there is nothing to be critically thinking about, right? I mean, so, which is where alternate media maybe comes in. Yeah, they say alternative media invented the voice of the internet, so you're welcome. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that that's just bad writing at that point, you know? Um, I hope that we haven't been too guilty of it, <laughs> um, but you, you, you certainly don't engage anyone it's bad rhetoric uh if you're not anticipating other viewpoints and writing in such a way as to keep them engaged i will never hear the end of this i once made our editor read um how to win friends and influence people <laughs> 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 which she thought was like the most white man thing anyone had ever told her to do <laughs> um and i was, it was very it was it, I, I, don't, I don't know what i hope to gain by that but, uh, uh no it was it was that thing i was like come on you know i was reading this thing and i just felt like she was alienating everyone i was like you know this like why don't you give this a try and uh i i, I don't Didn't think she ever i don't think she ever forgave me but um 
that's my story. Yeah, on that. I think yeah. I mean, a lot of obviously, if we're thinking cable news or stuff on the internet, we we'll just call it stuff, right? There, the to- yeah, the tone is so central to the quote unquote argument or whatever it is, right? And I think you're absolutely right. If you can't even get into the piece because it's so off putting, the headline or the person, you know, the, the personality on TV is just so aggressive or so angry or whatever it is. How can you then engage with I think that's a really important um, point. And, and and there's this sort of tension, like there's this all these people say, well, that's what the consumers want, right? They, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't have all these, you know, upworthy style headlines or all this fighting or all this or that if people didn't want it and people didn't consume it. But then if you look at studies like uh, if you look at research that comes out of like Pew and places like that, they most people actually say they want kind of just the information so there's a te- that's again another tension we don't really know if it's do people want it and so therefore they're giving it to them or this is what we're getting so therefore you're right there's it's kind of circular there is some research and it's not my area um but there is some research on um like cable news hosts and their styles and how that affects uh people and how they perceive the the content and how they treat people and things like that so that is an area of actual research because it is such a a fundamental thing but um i can tell you you know from from mass media and journalism research and what we do tone and cues like that like source cues matter so much because they allow us to instantly do limited work we just say nope we don't trust that it's gone it you know the sort of peripheral processing if you will whereas if so we so as humans where that's you know we do that so if they're going to be throwing and yelling and be bopping around, they're they're kind of telling us we don't really want you to think. <laughs> just just accept and process. You know, whichever one you are. If you're with us, good. If you're against us, well, you're going to change the channel anyway. So it's definitely it's it's tough for sure. And something I overhear in our editing process sometimes is uh, that always kind of makes me cringe. Though I know their intentions are good, or like, well, I I don't really know how I'm supposed to feel yet. You know, I'm going through this and I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel yet. And there's this pressure on the editing team to kind of just you know speak plainly oh this is this is why it's an outrage you know um and (laughs) um and it's kind of the attention span i guess of the internet and the um the 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 shareability that we're trying to you know harness and it does lead to um it's a bad it's a it's a it's 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 a bad guidepost Mm -hmm. you know um though the though sometimes the the brevity and the the impact you're trying to have the reason that you want you're telling the story is like this is what happened this is why it's terrible and here's what you should do and it's kind of all we're trying to and then and then we move on to the next but i don't know if we're helping the world by doing that or not yeah the sort of the i think part of the um the issue of using like data like social media data and other things like that tends to lead to thinking that that's the kind of stuff you should do because it's the stuff that gets shared or whatever it is um in that people love outrage, right? There, was, I can't remember who did it, but there was some some uh, um, organization that last year did. Was it Slate? Slate did uh, every day for three, like the whole year. What was the outrage of the day, right? That we live in like an outrage culture. Like every day, there is something to be outraged about. Like just like taken aback. There isn't, right? But the idea that that's what gets people to click and that's what gets mm-hmm. people to share. That you know, I think there is a real. We do a disservice if we rely as organizations and as researchers and whoever on just that kind of data, right? Because that, that doesn't tell us why somebody did it, right? Maybe they're sharing it to say this is terrible junk. We don't, the data point doesn't tell us that. So I think there's a lot going on where we're trying to extrapolate from behaviors that we don't even understand, really. Let's take one, one final question and then if people have other personal questions up front, Less a question than a comment, although you ended up getting to it uh, generally. Um, but I was going to comment as uh, regarding the kind of people say they want the Pew results, but they end up clicking, you know, the BuzzFeed or the Gawker, you know, thing. I think that it comes down to like the difference between who we want to be and kind of who we are in any given moment and the energy that we have. Because, you know, people will say, oh, yeah, I want to eat healthy and whole grains and broccoli and all these things. But, oh, I'm at the grocery bar and there's a Snickers right here, <laughs> you know. And so I think a lot of these things, they, they do draw attention. And, you know, you'll be reading maybe a serious article. And on the side is some, like, crazy headline where you're like, 
what is that? You know, that looks fun. And so I think there is an element, there's a huge discrepancy between the media we think we want to consume or be, want ourselves to want to consume and the media that actually in the moment looks tasty. Exactly. You're hundred percent right. That's why attitudes do not predict behaviors. Attitudes do not predict behaviors, right? And motivations do not predict behaviors. We don't have, we don't do a very good job of actually knowing what predicts behavior. In fact, mm -hmm. we know a lot about what people think and we do these things like behavioral intentions. Well, guess what? Everyone's going to say they're choosing the salad. <laughs> We know what we're supposed to say, right? So, yeah, I think that we don't do a good job of, of sort of knowing that, and we do do a good job of knowing what we're supposed to do. Yeah, for sure. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with consuming a little junk, right? So as long as you, I think the bigger issue, as long as you know what you're doing and you try to have a balanced approach to, not balanced in terms of like, I must read one from this, one from this, one from this, one from this, but expanding and, and really being open to reading, seeing, sharing, thinking about a variety of, of, of things, both mundane and silly to, to serious. When you realize you've eaten nothing but Tostitos and Skittles for a month. Yes, a yes, <laughs> yes. We've all had that month. <laughs> <laughs> or the, the, the constant anxiety of, you know, can I morally click on this? And if mm -hmm. I do, will everyone see? <laughs> <laughs> Your data yeah, trail. That's, that's, that's terrifying, you know? Like. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching City Channel 4. On TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.